at SD Bullion. Our everyday low prices are already lower than the big boys' so-called flash sales. One of the fastest growing bullion companies in the country, SD Bullion, just claimed a spot on the prestigious Inc. 500. So you have to ask yourself, why haven't you joined over 30,000 new customers who've recently made the switch to SD Bullion for the lowest gold, silver, and platinum bullion prices? To learn more, go to www.sdbullion.com and enjoy the lowest prices in the precious metals industry, period. Hey everyone, this is Elijah Johnson with SilverDoctors.com and with us today is Jim Willie, editor of the hat trick letter found on GoldenJackass.com. Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's a pleasure being back. We're, uh, <laughs> we're, we're in the, the wild zone now, aren't we? Golly, time is winding down and uh, it's getting very interesting. Definitely. And I'd first like to just uh, quickly touch on the presidential election. We were talking before the interview that basically you're saying that financial markets are frozen and something very strange is going on. Can you just expand on this? Yeah, I, I think we're in a state of suspended animation right now. There's a tremendous ah, disconnect. Um, I don't think there's a great deal of observations going on now with the financial markets. I think there's a preoccupation right now with the voting, the, the campaign, the election, a uh, tremendous amount of explosion of stories of voter fraud, you know, improper um, voter registration rolls, bust in aliens, immigrants, uh, disconnections with the the voting machines, exposure of the machines as changing votes, and notice that almost no changes of the votes favor Trump. It's like coin flips. I got well, I got 20 stories out there that the machines changed the votes. But on the 20 coin flips, not one ended up with Trump on the coin face. They all ended up with Hillary, which means 20 heads out of 20 flips, you know, one over 10 to the one over two to the 20th power. Uh, you're talking in the billions, one chance in the billions that such thing is, is random. You have falsified polls. You have got WikiLeaks now about treason, not just with Hillary, but with Obama, who claimed that he knew nothing about the Benghazi information, knew, knew nothing about the, uh, the destruction of the high classified tapes and emails and things like that with uh, the, the low security that uh, Hillary maintained as Secretary of State. So we're getting a preoccupation with the politics, a preoccupation with the war, a lot of threats from the, the Khazarian Nazis, as they should be called instead of neocons. It, it cuts across both Democrat and Republican lines. It's very amusing when I hear people tell me that, oh, gosh, I thought you were a Democrat. No, no, I am a freedom person. I'm a non-cabal, non-crime syndicate person. I'm a non-fascist, which means I don't like the Democrats or Republicans. So, and on top of that, if you look at the financial markets, there seems to be only one market that's getting any movement at all in the price, and that is the 10-year yield and the Treasury bond principal value price. Uh, it's moved from 1.5 or 6 to 1.9 percent, 1.85 percent recently. A little move recently in, in the oil price to get over 50, but it seems to be stuck at 50 and now 49 handle. This preoccupation with the politics and war and threat of nuclear war, uh, I think has mesmerized and turned a lot of the country in, into a, you know, kind of a catatonic state, Elijah. And it's you know, it's, I guess it's natural, but it's also sad to see because we're part of it is, is orchestrated fear-mongering uh, by the old Clinton Bush, Rockefeller, Rothschild, banker cabal with all their, you know, military-industrial complex and 
vaccination, big pharma, and network news. I'm hoping that in the net in the next few months that some network news organizations are acquired and lose their ownership. That's what I'm hoping for because the, the bias has been pro syndicate for so long, and now it's turning to be, you know, favoring Hillary. And anyway, we're in like a frozen state of animation and. It's interesting to watch, but it's also pathetic because so many people I, – I just saw a, a podcast today. It was a, a YouTube, and it was uh, Stephen Colbert and his nightly show going out and interviewing. He, he interviewed about 10 or 15 people. They're all young, and they're all happy that the premiums went up on Obamacare. We're becoming a nation of really dumb people. They're happy that the premiums for Obamacare went up. They're so dumb, they don't even notice that the Hillary on the, the third debate didn't seem at all like the 70-year-old Hillary in August in front of the Congress related to the treason trials, as I call it, the, the treason hearings. Uh, so, I mean, we've got a really dumb American population that uh, – can't recognize things right in front of their own nose, don't know what premiums mean for Obamacare. One moron for Stephen Colbert actually said, yeah, I mean, if it doubles, if the premiums double, that'd be great. Let's have Obama go out with a bang. What morons are running around in U.S. citizen shoes? Okay, so after the election, we're going to get some big surprises, and I'm really looking forward to positive movement. I'm looking for not just a release from the fascist dictatorship that's rather far reaching, touches big pharma, news networks, military contracting, you know, chemtrails. I want to see these things stopped. I want GMO food stopped. So let's see what happens after the election. I'm 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 somewhat hopeful. So anyway, let's move on to finance economics. What do you say? That sounds great. And one of your recent articles, you were talking about there's been an unprecedented dumping of U.S. bonds by China and now recently by Saudi Arabia. Can you explain why this is occurring? Yes. Uh, I think it was just a few weeks ago, an unprecedented $28 billion net sales of treasury bonds. And then the following week, $23 billion in treasury bonds. These, these numbers have never been seen before. Uh, the, the creditors for U.S. government debt are, are going through a massive transition. Uh, they're dumping treasuries. And I, I have to point to one of the biggest phenomena going on. We could be seeing some psychological damage to the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. If I'm a creditor and I'm holding treasury bonds and I'm seeing QE, the African-style monetary inflation, hyper-monetary inflation going on, I'm thinking, wow, they're pumping and propping the price of these bonds. It might be a good idea to get rid of them. Because like what happened in Zimbabwe, they're probably going to suffer a severe devaluation when reality strikes, when the QE is disconnected, when the Fed loses its control over the dollar and the bond. So I, th I think we're seeing the, the result of endless monetary and bond fraud by the U.S. government, by Wall Street, by the, the Federal Reserve. We're also seeing the U.S. being painted and, and somewhat correctly, as an agent and sponsor of terrorism and endless war and genocide, I mean, gosh, we just sold a bunch of, of armament to the Saudis and the phosphorus bombs, which burn people alive, and the Saudis are dropping them at hospitals. So... We're, we're party to this, and I think the U.S., not just from the financial standpoint, reputation as you know, full faith and credit of, of, a, of a nation, we're being, we're being exposed for our ISIS role.
sponsorship, funding, weapons. We just dropped, we just dropped 50,000 50, tons of armaments made available to the ISIS terrorists in Syria after the Russians blew up a bunch, like in convoys and installations and depots. So I think a lot of what we're seeing with the Treasury bond dumping has to do with abandoning the U.S. credit, U.S. debt securities, not just from a financial uh, credit-worthy status, not just as a, you know, a worthy borrower, but as a terrorist agent. But there are two other big, big reasons why foreign creditors are selling off treasury bonds. One is the, the, the global economic recession, and it touches their own countries, so they're seeing bigger deficits. And if you're a country like, say, Korea, and, and you suddenly got a deficit, and you're holding a bunch of billions of dollars in treasury bonds, you sell some of them. You cover your deficit. But there's a third reason. The lower crude oil price, the lower commodity prices, these are all affecting the country. So they're, they're, they're seeing bigger deficits. They're seeing smaller income, lower levels of income. So they're selling some of their reserves. And I believe at the same time they're saying, wow, we just don't want to hold these treasury bonds in such high volume because the Federal Reserve, the central bank in the United States, is printing money like Africans, like Zimbabwe. So, and then at the same time, they're saying, well, gosh, if they're involved in terrorism in a secretive way, we, we like to own fewer of these treasury bonds. So that's what I think is going on. And, and the numbers are really quite astounding. Uh, we have a, a net – last 12 months, we have a net almost $350 billion sold off just the last 12 months. And it's getting worse every month. So th this appears to be the climax that I've been expecting for the last two years where I said don't expect to see an enormous jump in the 10-year yield – the interest rate on the bond, expect to see a lot more hidden bond monetization by the Fed and the U.S. government's Department of Treasury. So the hidden printing press activity is enormous right now, Elijah. They're, they're covering it so that we're only seeing a move toward 1.9%, 1.8% on the Treasury 10-year yield. Uh, it should be 10 or 15%. It should be as bad as Greece ever was. It should be as bad as Italy ever was. We're at, we have a $1.2 trillion annual deficit last fiscal year. $1.2 trillion. I made a forecast back in 08, Elijah, that uh, they're going to go to 0%, and we will see a trillion-dollar deficit every single year for as far as the eye can see. I've been correct on that eight consecutive years. Now, another thing you talked about in your article, besides that we're seeing a dumping of U.S. Treasury bonds, we're also seeing a decline of U.S. Treasuries held in custody, so central banks' holdings kept at the U.S. Fed computer banks. Now, this is actually at a post-2012 low. So can you explain the significance of this and why it is occurring? Well, it's basically the same question in a different form. You're referring only to the location of where the treasuries are held. Uh, if, if you're a country like South Korea or France or Norway and you own a bunch of treasury bonds, it tends to be held at the U.S. government, at the U.S. Federal Reserve. They, they don't send off the bonds. They're held – in what they call custody accounts. And the, the TIC report, I believe it stands for Treasury International Capital. Uh, the TIC report is a delayed, I think it's two or three months delayed, so we, we get to, to see what's going on in July right now. Um, the TIC report shows the details uh, of the 
foreign accounts held in custody by the U.S. authorities and, and the Federal Reserve, which I, I call the U.S. Fed. It's on the U.S. soil. It defends the U.S. dollar. So it's, you know, I, I understand that it's a foreign entity and a foreign crime syndicate, but its, it's location for the criminal activity is on U.S. soil. Here, here are a couple of the weird things going on with the tick report in the last few months. Um, they separated out the OPEC details to make a Saudi line item. So it's not just <clears throat> OPEC nations. I, I don't know the exact name they put for it. I think it's called OPEC nation. They don't say Arab and OPEC nation. They they say uh, it's basically OPEC. Well, they're separated from OPEC, the Saudis. <clears throat> um, it's very interesting to see the, the Saudi details come out because I made a point back in 2014 that the U.S. authorities threw the Saudis under the bus. Uh, and that is when it became known that, that the U.S. and the, the London bankers stole the Saudi gold held in the Swiss bullion banks and the entire UBS <clears throat> UBS and Credit Suisse stories about criminality and U.S. Department of Treasury um, uh, coming down on them with penalties and you know foreign tax dodging accounts and all these different stories. That was cover for rendering Credit Suisse accounts and UBS accounts under the authority of the, the, the London bankers and the Wall Street bankers so that they could steal the Arab gold. Uh, and now we're seeing a <laughs> – this is really quite funny. The, the new law that permits lo private lawsuits against the Saudis <laughs> – the Saudis had almost nothing to do with 9-11. But now we have a congressional law that permits lawsuits against the Saudis. So they're trying to do a, a, a rather nationalized raid against the Saudis. And uh, I don't know why they would want to delineate exactly in the tick report what the Saudi bond holdings would be, except to point out maybe to the American public, there are billions there. Go for it. <laughs> well, what they're overlooking, Elijah, and this is almost going to be funny is that in the courts, the Saudis are going to have the opportunity to lay out the information, the data, and the evidence that they did not do 9-11. And they'll point to the Bush family and Langley and Mossad and MI6 in Britain with a lot of information, data, and evidence. So it might backfire. But then it might also backfire, and I'm getting a little bit of field here, but it's really quite interesting to note. It has been ver very well recognized that the entire war in Iraq was on a false cause. And there are something like two million victims, Iraqi citizens, killed. They might use the same law to extract money from the U.S. government, not the Saudis. Furthermore, there are a lot of victims for the Iran sanctions. They lost a lot of business in Europe. They might claim improper usage of sanctions and demand reparations from the U.S. government using the same law. So I think this law could turn out to be a Pandora's box. Anyway, the tick report is the, the data source for these U.S. treasuries that are held in custody. It'd be like your your best friend saying to hey Elijah, I know you've got a nice little bank there in your garage. Can you just keep my money in your bank in your garage? Because I know it's safe there. What we're learning is that <clears throat> money held in U.S. government custody is not safe, and foreigners are going to recognize that too. And that's why they're asking for their gold to be repatriated. It's not just Germany. It's it's in Netherlands and Austria and a few other countries. So I hope that answers your question. Definitely. And I'd like to move now to some viewers' questions. This first viewer's question is from Chris. And he's wanting to know about, you know, you've said in the past that there's going to be two kinds of dollars. And he's wondering if you think we could already be seeing 
this shice dollar, as you call it, if that could already exist as a digital dollar and the others being actual physical dollars that are printed. And right now he's pointing out that we actually have a lower value placed on digital currency, for example, um, when we use credit cards versus paying for something in cash. So could this shice dollar, as you say, be just digital currency? No, I think it's going to be a full-blown new currency. I'm told that there are 100 warehouses on the East Coast that hold what are officially called treasury dollars as opposed to Federal Reserve notes. The current dollar since 1971, the breaking of the gold standard, have been treasury notes. That's current dollars. The new dollar is sometimes called treasury dollars, treasury notes. Okay, there's a nickname now for the new dollars. They're called the rainbow dollars because they're multicolored. You know, all our dollars right now are green. Okay, the greenback. And that's been the way ever since I was a little kid. It's always been green dollars, no matter what they look like or what presidents are on them or, you know, whose signature is on it. But the rainbow dollars are going to be different. Now, I don't know a lot of details about credit card digital dollars and, and differences. It's very possible that the first inroad for the new dollar will be in credit cards because that is newly created dollar. All credit is newly created dollars. I mean, you don't need, uh, you don't, like, okay, if, if you're creating new money, you yeah, you've got the authority of the U.S. government, but the new money that comes from credit, it is fresh new money. So maybe we're starting to see the first evidence of the new treasury dollar. I don't know. I'm keeping my eye on this, and I haven't honestly gotten a lot of information, but this is new. Uh, I'm expecting we're going to get something much more disturbing where – People are told, you've got three months to turn in your cash inside the United States. This is a specific order inside the United States, a domestic executive order. You have three months to turn in your green Federal Reserve notes, the old dollars, for the new rainbow dollars, the Treasury dollars. And I think once that process is done, this is a very – time-consuming, arduous nuisance of a task to get all the domestic green dollars in the banks for conversion. Once that conversion process is over, I expect you're going to see a devaluation of the dollar, the new shice dollar, devalued 30%. Now, here's where it gets weird, confusing, and maybe potentially very ugly. They might do the bank bail-ins at the same time as devaluation after everybody's done converting. The devaluation takes place of 30% and possibly, this is my suspicion, my hypothesis, we will see the bank bail-ins at the same time and some banks will go out of business to be sure to benefit the Wall Street banks. So multi-step process here, but the key is that we're going to see new dollars, physical dollars that, go, that are going, go into your purse and your wallet and into your, your dresser drawer. They're going to be multicolored. I'm very curious what they look like. I mean, it was amusing a few months ago to hear the story that the $20 bill was going to be – the face was – not going to be any longer Andrew Jackson, but it was going to be Harriet Tubman. Um, and that had some hidden significance because Andrew Jackson was a arch, mortal enemy of the central banks. He was a president from the southern states, and he survived an assassination attempt. Most assassinations, by the way, in the United States have to do with a, an attempt to return to a legitimate dollar. And includes Kennedy. I'm talking about Buchanan, McKinley. They were gold standard advocates. They leave that out in our history books. Now, this question is from Jeffrey, and he's actually wondering about 
um, whether the next president of the United States who comes into office, will that make any difference in the sustainability of the dollar? I don't think so. Um, not unless the new president says, let's move forward, come up with a legitimate new dollar. Let's try to back it with some assets. And that's where the problem will come. Um, here's the big problem. And it doesn't matter who's in charge. It really doesn't. What, what does matter is, is what initiatives are in progress. Now, if you get a new president and says, Let, let's clean this up and let's make a legitimate currency, what that means is the U.S. is going to have to have its own currency. Another way of describing that is a domestic-only dollar. And here's the big problem with that, and I've been addressing this point for some time. I mean, like, for several months. It's in almost all of my interviews. If we have a new dollar, it's just for the United States, then it's going to have to be devalued because we're running a $500 billion trade deficit. That's got to sink in with people. Most Americans don't even know what a trade deficit is. The enlightened few who listen to interviews like this know that we have a big trade deficit. It was actually closer to 540 or 50 billion last year, whereas previous years it was closer to 500. It's getting worse. There's no recovery. There's no nothing. The federal deficit is another problem. We've got to finance the federal deficit, which for about three straight years, four straight years, was right around 100, I'm sorry, right around a trillion, right around a thousand billion. But last year it was 1.2 trillion, 1,200 billion. We need to finance these deficits. Together we're talking about almost $1.8 trillion a year. We need to finance these deficits, and while we're trying, we will see a devalued dollar happening in front of our eyes. While we are trying, we're going to struggle to come up with some asset backing for the new dollar. But here's the next risk. Whatever we back the new dollar with, we lose. Let's suppose we back it with every port facility in the United States and every commercial building in an urban center with the U.S. government making some kind of an arrangement for the private owner, what, whatever. I'm just making a point. We would then lose in one year almost, I would say, well over half. No, probably not. We would lose a good solid portion of commercial buildings. If we put up in collateral all the, uh, the industrial metal mines and all the coal mines in the United States, we would lose them all in the first year because we posted that as collateral and we had to shed it, had to forfeit it because of our trade deficit. Let me put this in, into perspective regarding the strategic petroleum reserves. I did a calculation a few months ago because you know some clients said, well, gosh, Jim, can't we back our our new dollar with, with oil reserves. And I said, well, not really. The, uh, the Alaskan reserves are not tapped. But let's just look for an argument's sake at the uh, strategic petroleum reserves and the many, many millions of barrels of oil that we have locked in that. So I did some calculation. I just used a, as a metric uh, $50 oil price. <clears throat> And that's where we are right now, by the way. So it's it's not a it wasn't a, a silly calculation, and I came up with with a figure of seventy one billion dollars, the value of the strategic petroleum reserve. So <clears throat> if we're to pay for our trade deficit, just our trade deficit, I'm sorry, seven seven billion, not seventy one, seven billion dollars is, is our strategic. Petroleum reserve because I remember it was 70 strategic petroleum reserves. We have a gargantuan <clears throat> trade deficit. We cannot cover it with our assets. We can't do it. And then on top of that, 
twice as big as the federal deficit. <clears throat> I think what we're going to end up doing, Elijah, is to cover our annual federal deficit with captured – I don't want to use the word confiscated because that implies the, the, the owners are no longer the owners. We're going to capture the pension funds. Start with 401ks, IRAs, KIOs. All we need is a trillion dollars a year in savings captured and put in the form of special U.S. treasuries. And that will take care of our federal deficit problem. Now, on an incremental basis, I don't know how we're going to cover the 19.7 trillion. I, I don't think we ever will. And we've got, you know, further obligations like with Social Security and Medicare and going into the future, probably on the order of 50 and 60 or 70 trillion dollars. We're never going to cover that. I think we're going to probably end up with a, uh, a restructure of the U.S. government debt. So whatever pensioners are forced into this captured situation where they must, by law, invest in special treasuries, I think they're going to be first in line. For both the, the treasury dollar, the rainbow dollar devaluation, and a debt restructure write down of U.S. government debt. Suppose they write down the U.S. government debt from the, the 19.7 trillion down to seven, down to six trillion, so it's more manageable. Well, that would mean you lose two thirds of the value of your pension fund. What happens then if you do a 30% devaluation on the dollar, then another 30% devaluation later down the road, total of 50%, <clears throat> 0 0.7 times 0.7 is 0 0.49. Well, then you lost another half. So it's possible that these forced pensions that are cap going to be captured, it's possible that you're going to end up with 10 or 20 or 30 cents on the dollar of your pension fund. In order to finance the U.S. government largesse, the problems, the wars, the welfare, the Obamacare, and all the nonsense. So, <clears throat> very, very interesting time, but uh, don't expect a rate hike. <laughs> I just don't. We're not going to get any rate hikes. That, that's silly talk. But the new president's going to have his, his hands tied, or her hands tied. Wh whoever is the president, they're going to have to deal with a new dollar. That's the reality. And I think the new dollar is is is... An absolute certainty because things are happening. Now, this viewer is wanting to know about, you know, some they're saying some people say before the complete destruction of the U.S. dollar, there's going to be deflation. So basically, there's going to be deflation before hyperinflation. I've heard this a lot as well. Is this your view? And if so, how and why would it happen in this particular order? It doesn't happen in this particular order. That's that's only because of the person's lack of knowledge of the situation. <clears throat> Let's go back to 2006, 7, and 8. Mortgage bonds, what happened to them? Did they go down in value in a big way? Yes. What happened to home values? Did that go down in a big way? Yes. We've already had the deflation. Where have you been? Where have you been? Did you not notice? Where have you been? We've had deflation. We've not seen it in the stock market. We have not seen smaller, lower indexes. We saw it in mortgage bonds. We saw it in junk bonds. We saw it in home values. We saw it in commercial values. We saw it in art collectibles. We saw a lot of different asset classes go down in value. That's your deflation. Where have you been? <clears throat> I've been saying now for six years, ever since QE was put on in, in 2011, or 12, five years. I've been saying, you don't get deflation, then inflation. You get deflation and inflation at the same time. You get asset deflation, falling asset values, both paper and physical types. The physical types is your home. You get, at the same time, inflation, and the inflation is coming in two forms that are evident to the eye. One is the hyperinflation from the Federal Reserve. They're printing money to cover our debts. They're printing money to redeem the Wall Street bonds. But we're also seeing, we did see, I think it's, it's actually less in the last year, but 
We saw every single year, take a look at the Chapman, Chapman Price Inflation Index. <laughs> Chapman did something very clever in early, it, it was exposed in, in early 2015. What he did was he took a basket of 500 items. I mean like a, a loaf of bread and you know, a, a bottle of, uh, of aspirin and a gallon of gasoline. He took 500 different items and tracked them <clears throat> at 50 different urban centers across the United States. And for a five or six year period, maybe a little longer, he came up with an estimate of every single year the price inflation was between 8 and 10 percent. So we've had inflation. All along the line, we've had deflation all along the line. Where have you been? Definitely. I think that's a very interesting perspective how, you know, you're saying it's not just deflation, it's not just inflation, but we see them at the same time. And overall, it actually has been about 8 to 10% inflation. And I know I've looked at shadowstats.com where they kind of take all the rigging out of the CPI, and they, I think they're showing... Um, anywhere from five to ten percent inflation. I'd have to uh, double check the exact number, but yeah, definitely it seems to definitely um, match what you're saying. Every single year, every single year. Now, juxtapose that with their deflator that they use for the the, the gross domestic product, the size of the economy. They say steadily that we're at 2% or 1.6, or they make a big deal that we're all the way up to 2.8%, when in reality we've been between 8 and 10%. So they're calling inflation growth. We should be seeing minus 5, minus 6% economic recession every single year, minus 4% minimum. They're calling it 1% growth, 2% growth, 1.5% growth. It's because all the inflation, they're calling growth. Definitely. I'm just looking at shadowstats.com right now, and they have two different ways of measuring inflation, and it's anywhere from 5 to 9% right now. So definitely very close to Chapman's. Um... But the Chapman, bear in mind, Chapman was just 50 different urban centers. It, you know, it wasn't Waukiki, Illinois. It, it wasn't Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. It was the urban centers. And uh, I noticed that when I looked at the details, it was the New York and the California cities that were over 10 percent price inflation every year. Uh, the conclusion of Chapman was that we've overestimated the economy size in the last five years by over 22 <laughs> percent. That's the error from saying that we've got a, a slow growth environment. Boy, what idiots they are. They're not so much idiots as they're corrupt. They know what they're doing. They're understating the price inflation so that, okay, I'll give you a quick example. They, they do a calculation of the GDP. They don't adjust anything. This year versus last year, it was uh, it was up it was up six percent, okay. Nominal up six percent. So they they subtract out three percent and they get three percent growth. They subtract the three percent because that's what they claim the inflation is. But the nominal growth, just the, the raw numbers from one year to the next, was up six percent. Well, if they did reality and had a 9% consumer price infl inflation index, subtract 9 from the 6, and you see a minus 3% for the recession. So they're calling a minus 3% recession, they're calling it a plus 3% because they're lying on inflation. The new president's going to have a, a nightmare problem. I don't think it's resolvable without a new currency. Um, we, we have both inflation and deflation happening at the same time. I'm very concerned what's going to happen if they stop the inflation engines, if they halt on the monetary inflation African style at the Fed, if they turn down the QE volume. I think they've been doing an experiment in the last few weeks to print less money and cover fewer bonds to see what happens with the stock market and see what happens with the bond market. And what they saw was that the 10-year the bond went from 1.6 to 1.9%.
Okay, well, that's not a real stark result from, from their experiment if they did one. If they turned off the, the bond buying machine and the, the dollar printing press, uh, you would see in the course of three months the U.S. Treasuries going up to a 10-year yield of, of at least 4 or 5%. And that would cause shock waves around the world. It would cause tremendous losses. So by maintaining QE, they, they not only redeem the Wall Street impaired toxic bonds, but they don't they don't encourage the foreigners to dump even more than they already are. Foreigners might be dumping partly because they they realize, well, interest rates can't go any lower. So let's sell out here because there's nothing more to gain. So they sell out to the Fed, who's propping it up. I've been telling people for the last year, sell your stocks because they're propping them up too. And buy gold, which they're suppressing. But the human tendency is to buy what's already gone up. I think dummies out there are buying treasury bonds because they've gone up. All right, well, moving on here to the next viewer's question, still on the topic of uh, the dollar collapse. This viewer is wanting to know how the dollar collapse will impact countries with no U.S. or Western banking relations, specifically Iran. Well, there's really no country that escapes the U.S. connections and regulations and, and trade. Uh, does Iran do trade with Europe? Yeah. Does the U.S. do trade with Europe? A lot. Does Iran do trade with China? Yes. Does the U.S. do trade with China? Yes. So there's no escape. It's, it's a global community of nations. Um, maybe the, the better rewrite of that question is what will happen to countries that don't hold significant treasuries and therefore are not vulnerable to the dollar and its movements? They will thrive. Iran is reported to have quite a lot of gold hidden. Don't know how much. And one of the untold stories of the Iran nuclear talks is the punishment for the U.S. government for having put on the sanctions under improper means, improper justification. Uh, I'm hearing that it was $190 billion dollars that has gone back to the Iranians. And to be sure, the majority of that is frozen assets that were Iranian, but there are also some penalties in there. Uh, if the Iranians want their money back, they get their funds unfrozen. But when cash is delivered to Iran, that is penalty. That's not releasing their accounts. So there's a lot going on with respect to Iran, <clears throat> and it's hardly in the news. You have to piece it together like most everything because the great majority of the news in the West is loaded with lies, propaganda, distortions, and tilt, bias. I hope that answers the question. It, it's, you know, th there's an alliance right now that, that's called the BRICS nations alliance. It's not just Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. There, there's something like 117 or 120 nations in the BRICS alliance. Uh, they all, I think, have some treasury bonds in their ownership. Uh, if they have a banking system, if they're smart, they put gold as their reserve, but most of them have treasuries, U.S. treasuries, U.S. government debt, as the foundation for their banking system. Um, it's pretty hard to escape that. It's very difficult because until the last few months, the norm for payment on anything having to do with, with trade, you know, a ship arrives loaded with stuff, whatever. Could be oil, could be containers, could be anything, could be raw material. Uh, <clears throat> they typically are paid in treasury bonds. Uh, treasury bills, to be more exact, the short-term treasury bill, the three-month, six-month, 12-month, the treasury bills. Okay, and, and therefore, even nations that haven't liked the U.S. financial and monetary policy or even, say, military policy, foreign policy, 
they tend still to have some treasury bills in their banking system. So very hard to escape that. But the countries that have, at a minimum, their exposure to the dollar, they are going to thrive because they're not going to be subject to any devaluation of the new dollar, conversion of the new dollar to, to the new dollar. And they're not going to be subject to vulnerability like a debt write-down, restructuring, which I think is inevitable. Well, what are we going to do? In, in five more years, we're going to be up to $35 trillion in our U.S. government debt. This is insane. I mean, I remember when I was a little boy, my, my father said, gosh, Jim, I'm, I'm very concerned. Only one thing, really, I, the Vietnam War is, is awful, but uh, I'm concerned about the deficit. I'm concerned about the U.S. government debt. But now he's not because it's too big. So he was more concerned about it when it was two and three trillion, and now he's not when it's almost 20. That this is the kind of thinking that Americans have. It's, well, I mean, if I don't think about it, maybe it's not a problem. If I don't think about it, maybe it'll go away. If I don't think about it, maybe someone else will fix it. No, no, it's going to blow up in our faces. Now, you talked about how Iran is, you know, purchasing a lot more gold now. This viewer is wanting to know, will they have enough gold to put their currency on some sort of gold standard? I don't know specifically what Iran is doing. Um, there's, it's like a, a closed book, a closed channel on, on news items out of Iran. Um, here's what I think is a general practice that might come about. Iran has, for instance, Iran, still Iran, Iran has a lot of oil and gas. They have other minerals, but let's leave, leave that out of the picture right now. They have a lot of oil and gas. They have a lot of energy deposits. They have a lot of energy reserves. Iran could make a deal with China to swap their annual production of oil and gas, commit it to China, and receive a few thousand tons of gold and have a commitment for, say, 10 years or five years. That's called a gold swap. I think we're going to see a lot of nations, in particular the BRICS alliance nations, they're going to be making resource swaps in gold swap contracts. Take little Bolivia, for instance. They're not a major player, but they are a significant supplier of industrial metals, platinum, copper, you name it. Aluminum, tin, silver. Bolivia is like just a bunch of hills loaded with metal. And the Chinese have been buying them steadily. Well, the Bolivians could set up some industrial metals plus silver swaps. And it's funny, silver is both industrial and a precious metal. I, that's one reason I like it so much. But Bolivia and China could set up a big contract for five or ten years of delivery uh, for industrial metals, including silver, and receive gold as a product as in, that, in that swap, in that trade. And that could serve as Bolivian reserves to participate in the gold trade notes, which is a topic I have not raised yet. But as we see the Treasury bill refused for trade payment, we're going to see more and more the gold trade note come into view which is basically a replacement of the Treasury bill. Think of it as a three, six, or 12-month uh, credit line where they post gold as collateral, and they use that to pay for what's on the ship. So it's a trade payment with a gold margin as collateral, and I don't know how they'd settle it. They'd settle it for in whatever manner they see fit, when things are done, things, and the product is removed, the cargo is removed from the ship, and it's, it's in the new owner's hands. Well, then they might do a, a full go, gold exchange, or they could do some other swap, or they could roll things over. I don't know. It's up to them, not my business. But uh, nations of the world, I think, are going to be – the reason I bring up the gold trade note is that it addresses the, the question posed – a lot of nations are going to swap their existing resources, and energy is a big one, but so are industrial metals. They're going to swap their industrial metals and, res and energy resources 
for a gold swap, for a gold allotment. And that will allow them to participate in the new commercial global system where trade payment is no longer done in the Treasury bill. The U.S. dollar is going to be phased out. I've been saying this now for a couple of years, but here's the order that I think it's going to take place, Elijah. First in trade payment with the gold trade notes planting the Treasury bill. Second will be in, in banking reserves where countries of the world say, well, we're using our gold trade notes. We're taking delivery in gold more, but we're transferring more of our treasury bills, converting them to gold, and we're loading up our banks bit by bit, month by month, with more gold reserves in the banking system. So first in trade, second in banks, third in currency. Whenever you hear about this gold trade note, just think, that the gold currency is not far behind, and what's intermediary for that will be the bank reserves. And this is where it's going to get very exciting and ugly for the dollar, because that's when nations of the world start selling their treasuries and converting to gold. I actually believe the new development bank for uh, the BRICS, I think it's going to have a very significant role in converting treasuries into gold. Why would they have a new development bank and a big ballyhooed Asian infrastructure investment bank? Isn't the new development bank the same role? No, I think the new development bank is going to be the it's going to be the gold acquisition facilitator, dumping treasuries, buying gold using the new development bank. They don't need a new development bank and an infrastructure investment bank. It's the same thing. So I think we've got a misnomer of the new development bank, and it's going to be for dumping sovereign paper, primarily treasuries, and buying gold. This is how the banks around the world are going to load up with gold, dumping treasuries. And the NDB, I think, is going to be a primary agent for that. All right. Well, Jim Willie, thank you so much for joining us today. Before we let you go, where can our viewers find you online? The website started 12 and a half years ago. This, this month was issue number 151. Wow. I remember I came here in uh, December of 2006, and it was about two and a half years into the newsletter, a little over 30 issues. So I've been here, I've been here a long time, almost 10 years. Um, the website is www.goldenjackass.com. Uh, this month was unusual, and it was because, I think, of the, the, the frozen situation, suspended animation, the, uh, tremendous attention on the politics and, and war threat. There really wasn't a lot of activity going on, and I almost had just one report, but instead I divided it up and made two rather, well, they, they're about two-thirds the regular size. So less, the two reports are these. It's the Global Money War Report, which is really the international battle worldwide, globally, uh, to defend the dollar. The Ukraine war and the Syrian war are to defend the dollar. That's not how it's described. It's to stop the Russian aggression. It's absolute nonsense. It's to interrupt the, ga the Gazprom pipeline from Russia to Europe and make it so Europe doesn't have an energy dependence on Russia. Then the Syrian pipeline also, a Syrian war, also has an energy component. The U.S. does not want any completed pipeline for the Iran gas. It's called the Iranian gas pipeline. It's interrupted. Why? Because there's a war. Scorch earth, wreck the country, create a lot of refugees, and interrupt the dependence, potentially, for the European energy supply from Iran, just like they interrupted from Russia. So that's the global money war report. It's a lot more than war. It's about central bank policy, QE, you know, the hypermonetary inflation, the bank insolvencies, a lot of different things. Uh, but the second report is a little more detail at the ground level, like for, uh, it's called the golden currency report. And it's a lot more ground level, like uh, actual Mint coin demand, actual Indian 
imported gold demand, policy changes for India. I include Russian developments and Chinese developments, both the, 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 the war that's heating up with Russia and the trade war that's been in effect for 10 years with respect to China. Russian and China issues and oil issues are all in the gold and silver, I'm sorry, the gold and currency report. Um, oil issues related to the death of the petrodollar de facto standard, that's in the gold and currency report. So it's been a labor of love, Elijah, 12 and a half years. I, I, I recharge my jets uh, in the couple weeks and that I'm not writing actively for the, the newsletter and, and reports. They were just posted on uh, the, the 21st, which was last Friday. The, the October reports, and uh, I enjoy this work tremendously. I kind of miss the marketing research and statistical analysis, model building, and hypothesis testing, and you know, deep deep stuff analysis. I, I I miss it, but I'm doing something very important now, and I don't regret it at all. This is far more important than uh, you know, computer industry marketing research. Um, I'm learning a lot. It seems like every two or three months I have to learn about something important. Uh, a few months ago I had to learn what the reverse repo was because the, the December interest rate hike was a pretty much a false story. I had to learn what that was really about. Um, it was to enable greater leverage from the Wall Street banks. Um, Rob Kirby has been very helpful whenever I have to learn something. <laughs> I say, Rob, I need to learn something. Can you help me out? He says, sure, what? <clears throat> so... A few years ago, it was about what the derivatives were. Now it's about what reverse repo is. And um, I built a good staff. They're not subject to me. They're more like my colleagues with a lot of respect mutually handed. Um, it, it's it's ten, nine or ten people. They're all men. Half of them are Americans. Half of them are not. And uh, we get along very well. You know, every once in a while, one goes out and one comes in. Had... Uh, Two new additions in the last, well, three years, and, and they're important additions. They they do significant contributions. So sometimes when I have a when I have a forecast, Elijah, it's a little funny. It's not mine. It's from a colleague, and he doesn't say to me, "Hey, Jim, you can take it as your own." No, I'll say this is a hat trick letter forecast, and it's compliments of Euroraj. Or this is a forecast that the, that the voice has explained to me on how it might unfold. And I, I'm the messenger. I'm the analyst. I'm the writer. I, I deliver it. So it's a very interesting uh, dynamic for producing the reports. It's a team effort sometimes. I, I'll ask someone, can, can you just put together a bunch of notes on this? And I'll, I'll try to write it up. But can you give me a synopsis on what you think is going on with respect, say, to Iran and the Eurasian trade zone. That was something Euro Raj did a month ago. I think it was the September report. So <clears throat> the two reports and it's six-month subscriptions, and I hope people can go to the website and look at the free material and eventually sign up for the Hattrick newsletter. It's, uh, it, it's, I think, very spellbinding now. And I always mention the two compliments I receive. One, one type is... I've been listening to your podcasts and interviews and reading your public articles, and I thought that was enough, but I finally thought I'd sign up. And some would say, you know, to give you a reward for good hard work, and I wish I'd signed up two years ago. And the other is, I used to be a Hattrick Letter subscriber in 08, 9, 10, 11, and I, I, I just went away, and I wish I'd never left. I'm back now. <clears throat> So it's nice compliments, and what I'm starting to get now is people sign up and say, I'm one of those guys who just listened to your podcast for free, and man, this is really interesting stuff. I should have done this a year ago. I should have signed up. And I get other people say, uh, I, I, I left for three years, and I, I bounced around, and I, I came back because your work is better than the ones that I was checking out. So... Good comparisons, good compliments, and I, I don't say it's a lot of fun. I'd say it's a lot of stimulus, and I get into arguments with my father. I say, Dad, these forecasts are coming true, and they're miserable, hard, hardship forecasts, and I, I don't enjoy the outcome. 
I enjoy the fact that I do good work. And my father says, yeah, Jim, I really think you, you enjoy the U.S. is going down. No, I enjoy that, that the U.S. cabal is going down. But he doesn't distinguish between the cabal and the government, and he flies his flag. I said, well, I want to get rid of those who captured the flag. And he said, I don't think anyone captured the flag. We're all Americans. So therein lies the conflict. And I, I don't think it's going to become clear until 9-11 is revealed. I really don't think it's going to be uh, made clear until then. And, and maybe it won't even be too clear even after then. So anyway, well, thanks for having me on. It's, uh, gosh, it's been two hours. I didn't expect <clears throat> to be two hours, but if that's okay. Uh, I know I'm a blabbermouth, so thanks for having me on, Elijah, and congratulations for being part of uh, Silver Doctors. I think it's a, a feather in your cap. Thanks so much, Jim, and thank you so much for your time today. Okay. All right, Elijah. Thanks for having me. Bye now. Evaluation, after everybody's done converting, the devaluation takes place of 30% and possibly, this is my suspicion, my hypothesis, we will see the bank bail-ins at the same time and some banks will go out of business to be sure to benefit the Wall Street banks. So, multi-step process here, but... The key is that we're going to see new dollars, physical dollars that, go, that are going to go into your purse and your wallet and into your, your dresser drawer. They're going to be multicolored. I'm very curious what they look like. I, I mean, it was amusing a few months ago to, to hear the story that the $20 bill was going to be – the face was not going to be any longer Andrew Jackson, but it was going to be Harriet Tubman. Um, and that had some hidden significance because Andrew Jackson was a arch, mortal enemy of the central banks. He was a president from the southern states, and he survived an assassination attempt. Most assassinations, by the way, in the United States have to do with a, an attempt to return to a legitimate dollar. That includes Kennedy. I'm talking about Buchanan, McKinley. They were gold standard advocates. They leave that out in our history books. Now, this question is from Jeffrey, and he's actually wondering about um, whether the next president of the United States who comes into office, will that make any difference in the sustainability of the dollar? I don't think so. Um, not unless the new president says, let's move forward come up with a legitimate new dollar, let's try to back it with some assets, and that's where the problem will come. Uh, here's the big problem, and it doesn't matter who's in charge. It really doesn't. What, what does matter is, is what initiatives are in progress. Now, if you get a new president and says, Let, let's clean this up and let's make a legitimate currency, what that means is the U.S. is going to have to have its own currency. Another way of describing that is a domestic-only dollar. And here's the big problem with that, and I've been addressing this point for some time. I mean like for several months. It's in almost all of my interviews. If we have a new dollar, it's just for the United States, then it's going to have to be devalued because we're running a $500 billion trade deficit. 
That's got to sink in with people. Most Americans don't even know what a trade deficit is. The enlightened few who listen to interviews like this know that we have a big trade deficit. It was actually closer to 540 or 50 billion last year, whereas previous years it was closer to 500. It's getting worse. There's no recovery. There's no nothing. The federal deficit is another problem. We've got to finance the federal deficit, which for about three straight years, four straight years, was right around a hundred, I'm sorry, right around a trillion, right around a thousand billion. But last year it was 1.2 trillion, 1,200 billion. We need to finance these deficits. Together we're talking about almost $1.8 trillion a year. We need to finance these deficits and while we're trying, we will see a devalued dollar happening in front of our eyes. While we are trying, we're going to struggle to come up with some asset backing for the new dollar. But here's the next risk. Whatever we back the new dollar with, we lose. Let's suppose we back it with every port facility in the United States and every commercial building in an urban center with the U.S. government making some kind of an arrangement for the private owner, whatever. I'm just making a point. We would then lose in one year almost, I would say, well over half. No, probably not. We would lose a good solid portion of commercial buildings. If we put up in collateral all the the industrial metal mines and all the coal mines in the United States, we would lose them all in the first year because we posted that as collateral and we had to shed it, had to forfeit it because of our trade deficit. Let me put this in, into perspective regarding the strategic petroleum reserves. I did a calculation a few months ago because, you know, some clients said, well, gosh, Jim, can't we back our our new dollar with, with oil reserves. And I said, well, not really. The, uh, the Alaskan reserves are not tapped. But let's just look for an argument's sake at the uh, strategic petroleum reserves and the many, many millions of barrels of oil that we have locked in that. So I did some calculation. I just used a, as a metric uh, $50 oil on Obamacare. We're becoming a nation of really dumb people. They're happy that the premiums for Obamacare went up. They're so dumb, they don't even notice that the Hillary on the, the third debate didn't seem at all like the 70-year-old Hillary in August in front of the Congress related to the treason trials, as I call it, the, the treason hearings. Uh, so, I mean, we've got a really dumb American population that... Uh, can't recognize things right in front of their own nose, don't know what premiums mean for Obamacare. One moron for Stephen Colbert actually said, yeah, I mean, if it doubles, if the premiums double, that'd be great. Let's have Obama go out with a bang. What morons are running around in U.S. citizen shoes? Okay, so after the election, we're going to get some big surprises, and I'm really looking forward to positive movement. I'm looking for not just a release from the fascist dictatorship that's rather far-reaching, touches big pharma, news networks, military contracting, you know, chemtrails. I want to see these things stopped. I want GMO food stopped. So let's see what happens after the election. I'm, 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 I'm somewhat hopeful. So anyway, let's move on to finance economics. What do you say? That sounds great. And one of your recent articles, you were talking about there's been an unprecedented dumping of U.S. bonds by China and now recently by Saudi Arabia. Can you explain why this is occurring? Yes. Uh, I think it was just a few weeks ago, an unprecedented $28 billion net sales of treasury bonds. And then the following week, 23 billion dollars in treasury bond. These, these numbers have never been seen before. Uh, the 
the creditors for U.S. government debt are, are going through a massive transition. Uh, they're dumping treasuries. And I, I have to point to one of the biggest phenomena going on. We could be seeing some psychological damage to the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. If I'm a creditor and I'm holding treasury bonds and I'm seeing QE, the African-style monetary inflation, hyper-monetary inflation going on, I'm thinking, wow, they're pumping and propping the price of these bonds. It might be a good idea to get rid of them because like what happened in Zimbabwe, they're probably going to suffer a severe devaluation when reality strikes, when the QE is disconnected, when the Fed loses its control over the dollar and the bond. So I, th I think we're seeing the, the result of endless monetary and bond fraud by the U.S. government, by Wall Street, by the, the Federal Reserve. We're also seeing the U.S. being painted and, and somewhat correctly as an agent and sponsor of terrorism and endless war and genocide. I mean, gosh, we just sold a bunch of, of armament to the Saudis and the phosphorus bombs, which burn people alive, and the Saudis are dropping them at hospitals. So we're, we're party to this. And I think the U.S., not just from the financial standpoint, reputation as you know, full faith and credit of, of, a, of a nation, we're being, we're being exposed for our ISIS role, sponsorship, funding, weapons. We just dropped, we just dropped 50,000 50, tons of armaments made available to the ISIS terrorists in Syria after the Russians blew up a bunch, like in convoys and installations and depots. So I think a lot of what we're seeing with the Treasury bond dumping has to do with abandoning the U.S. credit, U.S. debt securities, not just from a financial uh, credit-worthy status, not just as a, you know, a worthy borrower, but as a terrorist agent. But there are two other big, big reasons why foreign creditors are selling off treasury bonds. One is the, the, the global economic recession, and it touches their own countries, so they're seeing bigger deficits. And if you're a country like, say, Korea, and, and you suddenly got a deficit, and you're holding a bunch of billions of dollars in treasury bonds. You sell some of them. You cover your deficit. But there's a third reason. The lower crude oil price, the lower commodity prices, these are all affecting the country. So they're, they're, they're seeing bigger deficits. They're seeing smaller income, lower levels of income. So they're selling some of their reserves. And I believe at the same time they're saying, wow, we just don't want to hold these treasury bonds in such high volume because the Federal Reserve, the central bank in the United States, is printing money like Africans, like Zimbabwe. So, and then at the same time, they're saying, well, gosh, if they're involved in terrorism in a secretive way, we, we like to own fewer of these treasury bonds. So that's what I think is going on. And, and the numbers are really quite astounding. Uh, we have a, a net, last 12 months, we have a net almost $350 billion sold off just the last 12 months. And it's getting worse every month. So th this appears to be the climax that I've been expecting for the last two years, where I said, don't expect to see an enormous jump in the 10-year yield the interest rate on the bond, expect to see a lot more hidden bond monetization by the Fed and the U.S. government's Department of Treasury. So the hidden printing press activity is enormous right now, Elijah. They're, they're covering it so that
we're only seeing a move toward 1.9%, 1.8% on the Treasury 10-year yield. Uh, it should be 10 or 15%. It should be as bad as Greece ever was. It should be as bad as Italy ever was. We're, we have a $1.2 trillion annual deficit last fiscal year. $1.2 trillion. I made a forecast back in 08, Elijah, that uh, they're going to go to 0%, and we will see a trillion-dollar deficit every single year for as far as the eye can see. I've been correct on that eight consecutive years. Now, another thing you talked about in your article, besides that we're seeing a dumping of U.S. Treasury bonds, we're also seeing a decline of U.S. Treasuries held in custody, so central banks' holdings kept at the U.S. Fed computer banks. Now, this is actually at a post-2012 low. So can you explain the significance of this and why it is occurring? Well, it's basically the same question in a different form. You're referring only to the location of where the treasuries are held. Uh, if, if you're a country like South Korea or France or Norway, and you own a bunch of treasury bonds, it tends to be held at the U.S. government, at the U.S. Federal Reserve. They, they don't send off the bonds. They're held in what they call custody accounts. And the, the TIC report, I believe it stands for Treasury International Capital, uh, the TIC report is a delayed, I think it's two or three months delayed, so we get to, to see what's going on in July right now. Um, the tick report shows the details uh, of the foreign accounts held in custody by the U.S. authorities and, and the Federal Reserve, which I, I call the U.S. Fed. It's on the U.S. soil. It defends the U.S. dollar, so it's you know, I, I understand that it's a foreign entity and a foreign crime syndicate, but its its location for the criminal activity is on U.S. soil. Here, here are a couple of the weird things going on with the tick report in the last few months. Um, they separated out the OPEC details to make a Saudi line item. So it's not just... <clears throat> OPEC nations, I, I don't know the exact name they put for it. I think it's called o OPEC nation. They don't say Arab and OPEC nation. They, they say uh, it's basically OPEC. Well, they're separated from OPEC, the Saudis. <clears throat> um, it's very interesting to see the, the Saudi details come out because I made a point back in 2014 that the U.S. authorities threw the Saudis under the bus. Uh, and that is when it became known that, that the U.S. and the, the London bankers stole the Saudi gold held in the Swiss bullion banks. And the entire UBS, <clears throat> UBS and Credit Suisse stories about criminality and U.S. Department of Treasury um, uh, coming down on them with penalties and you know, foreign tax dodging accounts and all these different stories. That was cover for rendering Credit Suisse accounts and UBS accounts under the authority of the, the, the London bankers and the Wall Street bankers so that they could steal the Arab gold. Uh, and now we're seeing, a, <laughs> this is really quite funny, the the new law that permits lo private lawsuits against the Saudis. <laughs> the Saudis had almost nothing to do with 9-11. But now we have a congressional law that permits lawsuits against the Saudis. So they're trying to do a, a, a rather nationalized raid against the Saudis. And uh, I don't know why they would want to delineate exactly in the tick report what the Saudi... At SD Bullion, our everyday low prices are already lower than the big boy's so-called flash sales. One of the fastest growing bullion companies in the country, SD Bullion, just claimed a spot on the prestigious Inc. 500. So you have to ask yourself, why haven't you joined over 30,000 new customers 
who've recently made the switch to SD bullion for the lowest gold, silver, and platinum bullion prices. To learn more, go to www.sdbullion.com and enjoy the lowest prices in the precious metals industry, period. Hey everyone, this is Elijah Johnson with SilverDoctors.com and with us today is Jim Willie, editor of the Hattrick Letter found on GoldenJackass.com. Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's a pleasure being back. We're, uh, <laughs> we're, we're in the, the wild zone now, aren't we? Golly, time is winding down and uh, it's getting very interesting. Definitely. And I'd first like to just uh, quickly touch on the presidential election. We were talking before the interview that basically you're saying that financial markets are frozen and something very strange is going on. Can you just expand on this? Yeah, I, I think we're in a state of suspended animation right now. There's a tremendous ah, disconnect. Um, I don't think there's a great deal of observations going on now with the financial markets. I think there's a preoccupation right now with the voting, the, the campaign, the election, a uh, tremendous amount of explosion of stories of voter fraud, you know, improper um, voter registration rolls, bust in aliens, immigrants, uh, disconnections with the the voting machines, exposure of the machines as changing votes, and notice that almost no changes of the votes favor Trump. It's like coin flips. I got, well, I got 20 stories out there that the machines change the votes, but on the 20 coin flips, not one ended up with Trump on the coin face. They all ended up with Hillary, which means 20 heads out of 20 flips, you know, one over 10 to the one over two to the 20th power, uh, you're talking in the billions, one chance in the billions that such thing is, is random. You have falsified polls. You have got WikiLeaks now about treason, not just with Hillary, but with Obama, who claimed that he knew nothing about the Benghazi information, knew, knew nothing about the, uh, the destruction of the high classified tapes and emails and things like that with uh, the, the low security that uh, Hillary maintained as Secretary of State. So we're getting a preoccupation with the politics, a preoccupation with the war, a lot of threats from the, the Khazarian Nazis, as they should be called instead of neocons. It, it cuts across both Democrat and Republican lines. It's very amusing when I hear people tell me that Oh, gosh, I thought you were a Democrat. No, no, I am a freedom person. I'm a non-cabal, non-crime syndicate person. I'm a non-fascist, which means I don't like the Democrats or Republicans. So, and on top of that, if you look at the financial markets, there seems to be only one market that's getting any movement at all in the price, and that is the 10-year yield and the Treasury bond principal value price. Uh, it's moved from one point five or six to 1.9 percent, 1.85 percent recently. A little move recently in, in the oil price to get over 50, but it seems to be stuck at 50 and now 49 handle. This preoccupation with the politics and war and threat of nuclear war, uh, I think has mesmerized and turned a lot of the country in, into a, you know, kind of a catatonic state, Elijah. And it's you know, it's, I guess it's natural, but it's also sad to see because we're part of it is, is orchestrated fear-mongering um, by the old Clinton, Bush, Rockefeller, Rothschild, banker cabal with all their, you know, military industrial complex and vaccination, big pharma and network news. I'm hoping that in the, net, in the next few months that some network news – organizations are acquired and lose their ownership. That's what I'm hoping for because the bias has been pro-syndicate for so long and now it's turning to be, you know, favoring Hillary. And anyway, 
we're in like a frozen state of animation and it's interesting to watch but it's also pathetic because so many people I, I just saw a, a podcast today it was a, a YouTube and it was uh, Stephen Colbert and his nightly show going out interviewing he interviewed about 10 or 15 people they're all young and they're all happy that the premiums went up on bond holdings would be except to point out maybe to the American public they're billions there go for it <laughs> well, what they're overlooking Elijah and this is almost going to be funny is that in the courts the Saudis are going to have the opportunity to lay out the information the data and the evidence that they did not do 9-11 and they'll point to the Bush family and Langley and Mossad and MI6 in Britain with a lot of information data and evidence so it might backfire but then it might also backfire and I'm getting a little bit of field here but it's really quite interesting to note it has been ver very well recognized that the entire war in Iraq was on a false cause and there are something like two million victims Iraqi citizens killed they might use the same law to extract money from the US government not the Saudis furthermore there are a lot of victims for the Iran sanctions they lost a lot of business in Europe they might claim improper usage of sanctions and demand reparations from the US government using the same law so I think this law could turn out to be a Pandora's box anyway the tick report is the the data source for these US treasuries that are held in custody it'd be like your your best friend saying to hey Elijah I know you've got a nice little bank there in your garage can you just keep my money in your bank in your garage because I know it's safe there what we're learning is that <clears throat> money held in US government custody is not safe and foreigners are going to recognize that too and that's why they're asking for their gold to be repatriated it's not just Germany it's it's in Netherlands and Austria and a few other countries so I hope that answers your question definitely and I'd like to move now to some viewers questions this first viewers question is from Chris and he's wanting to know about you know, you've said in the past that there's going to be two kinds of dollars. And he's wondering if you think we could already be seeing this shice dollar, as you call it, if that could already exist as a digital dollar and the others being actual physical dollars that are printed. And right now he's pointing out that we actually have a lower value placed on digital currency, for example, um, when we use credit cards versus paying for something in cash. So could this shice dollar, as you say, be just digital currency no I think it's going to be a full-blown new currency I'm told that there are 100 warehouses on the East Coast that hold what are officially called Treasury dollars as opposed to Federal Reserve notes the current dollar since 1971 the breaking of the gold standard have been Treasury notes that's current dollars the new dollar is sometimes called treasury dollars treasury notes okay there's a nickname now for the new dollars they're called the rainbow dollars because they're multicolored you know all our dollars right now are green okay the greenback and that's been the way ever since I was a little kid it's always been green dollars no matter what they look like or what presidents are on them or you know whose signature is on it but the rainbow dollars are going to be different now I don't know a lot of details about credit card digital dollars and and differences it's very possible that the first inroad for the new dollar will be in credit cards because that is newly created dollar all credit is newly created dollars I mean you don't need uh, you don't like okay if, if you're creating new money yeah, you've got the authority of the US government, but the new money that comes from credit, it is fresh new money. So maybe we're starting to see the first evidence of the new treasury dollar. 
I don't know. I'm keeping my eye on this, and I haven't honestly gotten a lot of information. But this is new. Uh, I'm expecting we're going to get something much more disturbing where people are told you've got three months to turn in your cash inside the United States. This is a specific order inside the United States, a domestic executive order. You have three months to turn in your green Federal Reserve notes, the old dollars, for the new rainbow dollars, the Treasury dollars. And I think once that process is done, this is a very time-consuming, arduous nuisance of a task to get all the domestic green dollars in the banks for conversion. Once that conversion process is over, I expect you're going to see a devaluation of the dollar, the new shice dollar, devalued 30%. Now, here's where it gets weird, confusing, and maybe potentially very ugly. They might do the bank bail-ins at the same time as devaluation.